This video is an introduction to two chart types that are useful in project management. The top one is a PERT chart program evaluation and review technique, useful primarily during the planning and organizing phases of a project. I believe it was developed in the 1950s as a collaboration between Booz Allen Hamilton and the US Navy. The bottom one is a Gantt chart, useful primarily during the leading and controlling phases of a project. There are a number of claims to initiating this chart type, but Henry Gantt seems to be the person most often credited with its development around 1905. Before addressing Pert and Gantt charts, let's look a bit at the start of a project, say an assembly manufacturing project. The project shown here consists of 20 piece parts to be assembled. Some group of engineers has determined that the work can be divided into four sub-assemblies. Task one is to assemble five items into sub-assembly one. Task two is to assemble four items into sub-assembly two and similarly for tasks and sub-assemblies three and four. Once all four sub-assemblies are ready, they can be combined into the final assembly identified as task five. This table shows the conversion of the tasks into a table that is the start of our PERT process. The three columns in the table provide each task's identity its execution time, and its prerequisites, the tasks that must be completed before this task can start. This information can be fed into a scheduling application, but in this case, we will proceed manually in order to see how the process works. The first step is simply to transfer the task ID, execution time, and prerequisite information to a diagram. Then proceed from left to right, determining cumulative elapsed times from the sequence of execution times. Set the starting time at zero. Minutes, hours, days, whatever. For this example, it doesn't matter. We'll use days just so we have something better than just time units. Start at day zero, task A takes two days, so will be complete at the end of two days. Task B starts after day two, takes three days to execute, so is complete at the end of day five. Task C also starts after day two, takes four days, so is complete at the end of day six. And task D, also starting after day two, takes five days, so is complete at the end of day seven. Now it gets interesting. Task E has to wait for both tasks B and C to be complete before it can start. B is done after five days, C after six days. So task E can begin only after day six when both its prerequisite tasks are complete. So task E can start after six days, take six days to execute, so is complete at the end of 12 days. Task F also has two prerequisite tasks can start after day seven, take seven days, so is complete after 14 days. One more task to complete. Task G can start after 14 days, takes four days, so is complete after 18 days. And we're done. The project cumulative elapsed time is 18 days. Next, determine the critical path, the sequence of tasks that is the limiting factor in the project schedule. 
whereas we work from left to right to determine the cumulative elapsed times to determine the critical path, we work from right to left. Only one link to the end, so task G must be on the critical path. Task E or F, task F. That's complete after 14 days is the one that's delaying us rather than task E, which is complete after 12 days. So task F is next on the critical path. Next task on the critical path, task D, which is complete after seven days rather than task C, which is complete after six days. Task D only has one prerequisite, so task A is on the critical path, and the critical path is expressed as A, D, F, G. What we would like to know now is how we can decrease the project cumulative elapsed time so that we can compete the project earlier than 18 days. Decreasing the elapsed time on tasks not on the critical path won't help. We could reduce all those times to zero and still have the 18-day cumulative elapsed time. To reduce the project cumulative elapsed time, we need to reduce the execution time of one or more of the tasks on the critical path. For our purposes, the largest possible impact on the schedule would be by reducing the execution time of the longest task execution time on the critical path. In this case, that would be task F. In the real world, it would be both simpler and more complex and would depend on what resources, people and or machines, could be shifted or added to the tasks on the critical path, which might or might not be the longest task execution time task. Once one has decreased the critical path cumulative elapsed time, then it's possible that the critical path has shifted. Then we complete the cumulative elapsed time process and the critical path process until there are no more time decrease possibilities. Now that we've got the PERT chart complete, we want to have a Gantt chart so that we can have a nice graphical display and to track progress and to present to our colleagues. The Gantt chart is derived directly from the PERT chart. In the Gantt chart shown here, the tasks on the critical path are shaded in red. Note the task-by-task -task correspondence between the PERT chart and the Gantt chart. On both charts, task A takes two days and is complete after day two. Task E starts after day six, takes six days, and is complete after day 12, and similarly for the rest of the tasks. As time and work proceed, the progress can be recorded on the Gantt chart by using a different color to indicate completed work. In this case, we've used blue to indicate the completed work. All seems to be going well except for task E, which for whatever reason has not started. This is the beauty of a Gantt chart, a succinct visual status display. Here is a short PERT exercise for you to try. If you'd like to try it, I suggest that you pause the video while you work on the exercise, then restart it when you're ready to check the solution. And here's the solution. The next step would be to develop a Gantt chart, which can be used to track the progress. A PERT table can be easily converted to an Excel spreadsheet. Just add two additional columns, start time and end time. Start time equals zero for tasks with no prerequisites. For each task, the end time equals the start time plus execution time. 
The only slightly challenging item is determining the start times. For a task with a single prerequisite task, the start time equals the end time of that prerequisite task. For a task with multiple prerequisites, the start time equals the maximum of the prerequisites end times. So long as the topology of the project does not change, the Excel PERT version calculates accurate task start and stop times and the project cumulative elapsed time. To use the Excel PERT to determine the critical path requires manual intervention and must be redone each time a task execution time is changed. One common error in using the PERT diagrams is calculating the start time. The task start time is the maximum of the end times of the prerequisite tasks, not the minimum, the sum, the average, the square root of the sum of the squares, just the maximum. The second type of common error I'd like to mention is determining the end time of a task and its contribution to the start times of following tasks. Recall that we work strictly from left to right to determine cumulative elapsed times and eventually the project cumulative elapsed time. I occasionally see the task end time calculated by adding the execution time of a task and the execution time of a following task. In the diagram here, one would expect the end of task A to be 2, but in this case it's shown as the sum of the execution time of tasks A and B or A and C or A and D. Don't do this. This particular case has the additional oddity of determining three different end times for task A. There is at least one alternative nomenclature for PERT diagrams. My nomenclature uses the blocks for task identities and execution times and the arrows for the cumulative elapsed times as shown here. An alternative PERT nomenclature is to show milestones and elapsed times in the blocks and the task identities and execution times on the arrows. We've treated the task execution times as deterministic. There is often some uncertainty how long a task will take. This, sto this stochastic PERT diagram shows the individual uncertainties and the resulting uncertainty in the project cumulative elapsed time. Instead of task A assigned as two days, optimistic time is one day, expected time is two days, and pessimistic time is three days. Similarly for the other task execution times. By the time we get to the project cumulative elapsed time, instead of 18 days, it's between 10 and 26 days. As the project proceeds, we can get feedback from the Gantt chart and convert some of the early stochastic times to deterministic times. That concludes the PERT and Gantt video. I hope it was a good use of your time.